Hey guys, welcome back to the Road to 528 MCAT test prep course. This is the third topic from the organic chemistry section that I'll be covering. In this video, I'll be going over everything you need to know about bonding that will show up on the MCAT. This will be a shorter video than the previous ones because this topic is not extensively tested on the MCAT like the others. However, it's still very important to know these concepts as every question on the exam matters. Bonding is not a particularly difficult topic, so hopefully this won't be too bad for you guys. With that, let's begin our discussion on bonding and organic chemistry. Let's start off with a quick recap of atomic orbitals and quantum numbers. Quantum theory is a topic that's more suited for a general chemistry video, and I'll be making those in the future that will go for uh, quantum theory in depth. But for now, let's focus on this concept with the important parts of it, focusing on the respect to organic chemistry. Quantum numbers are used to describe different properties of an atom, and they all have different organizational levels and values that can be used to, that can be assigned to them. Let's start off with the first quantum number, the principal quantum number. It's commonly referred to by its symbol N, and it's used to describe size, or more specifically, its energy level. So I'll write that here really quick. The lower the energy level, the closer the shell is to the nucleus. So, And on the MCAT, we will be seeing values of this going from 1 to 7 at most. In theory, it can be any integer from one to infinity, but the MCAT will not test you above anything above seven. So let's move on to the next one. Within each cell shell, we have several subshells, which are described by the azimuthal quantum number, which uses the symbol L as its, uh, or the letter L as its symbol. The azimuthal quantum number describes the shape of the subshell. The values of L are always capped at N minus one. So, Common values of this will be 0, 1, 2, and 3, which are used to refer to S, P, D, and F subshells. Energy increases as L increases. So I'll write that right here. Now, within each of these subshells, we have orbitals that are used to describe that are described by the magnetic quantum number or m sub l. This range, this number ranges from negative the negative value of l to the positive value of l. Each orbital has a specific shape, which signifies the area that an electron can be found in the atom. An s orbital is spherical, while p orbitals have two lobes connected to them by a node. There are three of them called p x, p y, and p z. I'll draw those for you guys right now. So. Like I said, an S1 is just a sphere, a perfectly uh, a perfect sphere. Uh, PX will look something like this, PY like this, and PZ like this. Note that PZ can also be presented to you uh, in a way where it looks like it'll be going into the screen like one This will be one lobe that's pointing out at you and there'll be another lobe that's going into the screen Just remember that PZ is uh, on the third dimension the X is one dimension Y is another and P is the last one D and F orbitals are not tested on the MCAT fortunately as they'll be very complicated and they're just out of the scope of the exam So lastly, let's uh, talk about the magnetic spin number which is referred to as m sub s and tells us the charges of the two electrons present in an orbital. The values for it are either negative one half or positive one half. Feel free to screenshot this chart guys, it will be very useful for you to study for the MCAT. Next up we have the concept of molecular orbitals. This is when two atomic orbitals combine. By adding or subtracting wave functions we can create different kinds of molecular orbitals. If the wave functions have the same size, being both positive or both negative, we can create a low energy bonding molecular orbital. Lower energy means that it's more stable. 
If the signs are different, we get a higher energy, unstable anti-bonding molecular orbital. Let me show you how uh, these orbitals will look like. All right, so as you guys can see here, this first example, this one right here, has two functions that are both positive. So as a result, by combining them together, they form a bonding orbital. Note that they're both connected to each other. We added these two together. Now let's move on to the second one. The second one has functions of the opposite sign. So as a result, these two, this is what we call an antibonding molecular orbital. In this third example, you can see that the uh, functions are still connected to each other, even though one has already uh, had a function added to it. The positive function connects to the positive side of the neutral function and forms a bonding orbital. The same thing occurs with this last example here. This one also will be a bonding orbital. As you can see, the positive ones are connecting themselves to each other. Get familiar with these examples, guys. They're essential for understanding the process of uh, wave function problems. Let's talk about sigma and pi bonds now. Sigma bonds are formed when molecular orbitals, when a molecular orbital is formed by a head-to-head -head, head -head or tail-to-tail -tail overlap. It's important to note that all sigma bonds are single bonds. Pi bonds are formed when two p orbitals line up in a parallel fashion causing their electron clouds to overlap. You can see how it looks like in this visual right here. Another way you can see this formation of pi bonds is something like this. Diagrams like the one I just drew, they highlight the overlapping of the electron clouds. Note that one sigma bond and one pi bond will form a double bond, while one sigma bond and two pi bonds will form a triple bond. There is no rotation around the bond axis, by the way. Pi bonds only form after a sigma bond is formed. Remember that more bonds mean less bond length. Therefore, you will need more energy to break these bonds. So I'll write down the, the strength of these bonds. So just remember that triple bonds are the strongest, followed by double, then sigma, then pi bonds. Now that we've collect, co covered molecular orbitals, let's finish this video off with hybridization. We know that carbon needs four electrons to complete its octet. We also know that four sigma bonds in methane are equal. But why? Wouldn't there be an asymmetric distribution? We learned in our general chemistry classes that there would be two valence electrons in the 2s orbital and one each in the px and py orbital. Why are the sigma bonds in methane equal then? Well, the reason why is because of hybridization. Hybridization allows hybrid orbitals to be formed by mixing different uh, 
different orbitals. This image on the right shows how hybridization works with an sp3 orbital. One 2s electron is promoted to the uh, to the 2pz orbital, forming four valence electrons with one electron. They can be mixed together to form hybrid orbitals or hybrid molecules. Another thing I would like to touch on is the concept of S character. S character is a concept where you that you might see on test day, and it's fairly easy to understand. Once you determine the specific type of hybridization that the molecule has, you can determine the S orbital based on how much of it is present with respect to the other orbitals. So for example, an sp3 orbital would have 25% s character and 75% p character. That's because there's only one s orbital, but there's three p orbitals. One out of the four total orbitals is one fourth or 25. So that's how you get a uh, 25% s character. Sp2 sp orbitals have 33% uh, S character, and Sp orbitals will have 50% S character. So I'll write that down here too as well. Keep in mind that uh, on test day, they could also ask you for P characters instead. The logic behind P characters is the same as S characters. So as long as you understand this, you guys should be fine. Now let's move on to the sp2 hybridization. sp2 hybridization is mostly seen in alkenes as opposed to alkanes. The third P orbital of each carbon in a double bond is not hybridized. This, is, this unhybridized orbital participates in the pi bond. The sp2 orbitals are 120 degrees apart from each other, allowing for maximum separation. On the right, you can see a picture of an ethane molecule. This illustrates the makeup of an sp2, mo SP2 molecule. Two of the sp2 hybridized orbitals are used to form the CH bonds. So these two, they're used to form CH bonds, this one and this one. The other hybrid orbital is used to form the sigma bond for the double bond, so it's this one right here. The unhybridized orbitals, the ones you see right here, they're used to form the pi bond of the double bond. So we talked about sp3 and sp2. Now let's move on to sp orbitals. sp orbitals are used for triple bonds, and they are 180 degrees apart from each other. There are two ways an sp hybridized molecule can be expressed. It can either be two bonds that are placed between a carbon and another atom, forming a triple bond, so it would look something like ethene. So C, one, two, three, C. This is one option. Or it, uh, the other way it could be formed is by expressing two double bonds between the carbon and two other atoms, so like carbon dioxide. So it would be like this. So when you think of an sp hybridized uh, orbital, think of either triple bonds or two consecutive double bonds. Let's wrap this video up with a discussion on resonance. Resonance structures are essentially different ways you can draw a molecule by rearranging the bonds it has. Resonance structures have equal stability and can equally contribute to shape. However, these forms are usually not in equilibrium. The true form of a, molecular, of a molecule comes from the hybrid of all of its resonance structures. You can see in this example right here that the carbonite molecule has two different resonance structures, this one and this one. Both have equal preference. Therefore, the true form of, these, of this molecule is actually a hot resonance hybrid of the two, where the double bonds and the negative charges, uh, sorry, where the double bonds and the negative charges are formed as two partial negative charges and two partial double bonds within the carbon. If the stability were different between the two, however, the electron density would prefer the more stable form. Some resonance structures can be favored if they, have, if they lack formal charges or they fill out a full octet. 
That about covers everything you guys need to know about bonding for the MCAT. I covered the concepts of quantum numbers, molecular orbitals, sigma and pi bonds, hybridization, and resonance structures. I hope you all learned something from this video, and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to leave a comment and I will respond as soon as possible. I'll be uploading several more videos covering organic chemistry, as well as the other topics on the MCAT. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you guys next time.